Hello, Lux On Demand family. My name is Greg, and I am so excited to welcome you here on YouTube. Typically, we do our services live every Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. EST at twitch.tv slash Lux Digital Church. We get to chat with you live and talk with you live every week there. But we are also honored that you have joined us here on demand on YouTube. We have a lot of awesome resources and videos that you can check out here on our channel. But right now, I just want to introduce you to the talk that we have and say that I really hope that you enjoy. Thank you for joining us. We love you guys. Amen, church family. I, you know, there's a uh, few things funnier than watching Stormbrave ask for a live gator attack on stream. So thank you for that. Stormbrave, appreciate that, guys. Yeah, some amens in chat. Uh, hey, thank you guys all for being out here tonight. If I ever look down, just so you know, it's not that I don't care about you and the camera. It's that your entire chat is within arm's reach of me and you're my church family. So I get the chance. It's like when you were, when I preached in a physical church, I would like, I would like preach out and I would make eye contact with people, you know, which is sometimes unnerving for, for folks. And I don't make, I, like I, the time that I'm looking at you is actually when I'm not making eye contact with you. It's when I'm looking down and seeing the chat. Uh, hey, if you're here with us, especially if you're here for the first time tonight, I want to welcome you and thank you for being here and being part of our community tonight. My name is Mark. I'm the lead pastor here at Lux. And it's, uh, you know, I get the, the joy and the privilege uh, to be able to teach and preach every week here at Lux for the most part. And, um, but it's our entire team that surrounds this whole thing that makes makes it work. You know, there's tons of people in chat tonight who are amazing, incredible people who are part of our dream team, who are serving week in, week out, and are just here. You know, people like Chino Mage, who's who's here and leading prayer uh, once a month, and uh, lots of other people who do that as well. We have folks who are here. A special shout out to Sheebs tonight, who's here virtually every single week, pushing the buttons, making sure that everything that we're saying and doing is coming through to you, which, you know, if it wasn't for him, like this stuff just doesn't run. It doesn't happen. He hasn't just run the stream. He's built the PCs that everything runs on. We have Greg who's taking pictures in the background and a host of people who are building presence on social media now. Um, a special shout out to them. So we have people all across Lux who are serving. It's not a one man show. It's not just me. Even if I'm the one who gets the most time on camera on a given in service. It's an enormous team of people who are constantly serving and showing the love of Jesus to people in the online gaming community, which is so incredibly cool. So thank you so much, Dream Team, and thank you to everybody else who serves in all the various capacities across our church, because it just simply does not happen without you. We appreciate you. We love you. And we think that you're amazing. Um, I want to welcome anybody who's here with us for the very first time tonight. If you are here for the first time, thank you so much for being here with us. You're giving us a part of your Wednesday night. There's so many more things that you could be doing on a Wednesday night in the middle of summer. You could be hanging out outside or at a bonfire or, or just playing a video game. And instead you're here hanging out with us. And I want you to know that that is meaningful to us and we appreciate you. And we're glad that you're here and you are one of our honored guests. It's a privilege to have you here with us and you matter to us. You matter to us a ton. And so we've been thinking about you and we're glad that you're here. If you're joining us later on over, over VOD or over YouTube or over podcast, I want to welcome you in as well. Thank you for being here. And we want to actually get to know you. And so this isn't for our live audience, but if you're tuning in later in the panels below, if you're on the VOD here on Twitch or if you're on YouTube or on our podcast in this week's episode, you can find a link to our Discord server, which is where we are at every single week, every day, 24 seven. We're there hanging out and getting to know one another and growing together, um, hanging out outside, Gat Magan says, yes, I, I feel you. Uh, sometimes it's hard to do that as gamers, to get outside and let the sun scorch you and burn through your flesh. It's very difficult. Um, but anyway, uh, if you are tuning in later on, like grab that link, sign up for Discord. I know it's a lot to learn. I know it's an obstacle, but it, church is more about more about more than about just spectation. It's it's also participation. I said that last week. I'm going to keep saying it. Come and join us. Become part of the community. Join a small group. Get plugged in. Read the devotionals. Be part of the Bible studies. Actually grow in your faith, not just by listening, but also by participating. Tonight, we're in part two of a six-week collection of messages where we've been looking at the book of James. And in this series, we've been talking about some of the problems that we're facing in 2022. And I'm a firm believer that the problems that we face today are problems that they face back then and that there are ancient solutions to our modern day problems. In fact, 
That's our key statement for this series. The one thing that links all of our messages together and that we keep going back to over and over again. Our modern problems have ancient solutions. And maybe not every one of our modern problems, but many of them. We can look back and we can find solutions to some of our problems in ancient wisdom. And James is really a book that's basically written on wisdom. It's wisdom literature for the most part. It's sort of like short and punchy sayings and comments that the apostle James wrote and then handed down to the church in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And now you might not know much about James or anything, and that's okay. We actually have a Bible project video that will give you an overview of the book of James. And I think JT is going to hit exclamation point project in the chat here in a moment. And you can grab that link and actually watch like a seven or an eight minute it might be 12 minute video that gives you an overview of who james was and what the book was about it gives you an overarching understanding of it and here at lux we do a lot of sort of like short five or six piece series that are topical by nature and it's dealing with a specific subject but it's also important that we study a book of the bible or we focus some time and energy in a specific book so that's why we did that last summer and that's why we're doing it this summer why it's important that we don't just get things that are applicable to our lives but it's important that in addition to getting things that are applicable to our lives, that we are also uh, learning more about the overarching narrative of what the Bible actually says. If we're Christians and we say that we believe this stuff, then we should live as though we actually believe it. And we should have some sort of base of knowledge about what it says. So when we go through a book of the Bible, it helps us to do that. Now, we've been dealing with certain problems, and one of the problems that's in our world today, and it's no surprise, oh, don't worry about it, JT, we're glad that you're here, it's no big surprise that perception of Christianity is not great in many parts of our world today. The way people perceive and understand what Christians are and what the church is about is often not very good. Now, there are some parts of the world where the church is seen highly still, but in most first world parts of the country, in the United States, in Canada, in most of the EU, the church is not seen in a very good light. In fact, back in 2007, Barna, which is a research group that does a tremendous amount of research on different elements of the Christian faith, um, Bible Project's actually one of the first YouTube channels I started listening to when I rediscovered my faith a couple of years ago. Pog, yeah, Bible Bible Project's incredible. God, God, and we're so glad that you uh, that you've experienced that. Um, back in 2007, uh, the Barna Research Group did a project, a massive scale project, trying to get an understanding understanding of what culture actually believed or thought about Christians. Um, and specifically, they were looking at millennials. Now, 2007 in millennials is a little dated. Most of our emphasis has shifted to Gen Z now, and it's 2022, obviously. So this is 15 years later. But this research from 15 years ago, it was amazing. I actually looked back in a book that has it in it, and the book is called Unchristian, by the way. David Kinnaman, who's the president of the Barna Group, uh, published that book. And I think you, you could pick it up for like 12 bucks on Amazon or something like that, but it's Prime Day, so maybe cheaper right now. I'm sure it's cheaper on Kindle or something, um, but it's basically a book compiled of stories and research, and it kind of gives an insight into what non-believers or people who don't go to church, don't believe in Jesus. I hate the word non-believers, by the way. It just seems so nasty and derogatory, but people who don't follow Jesus, it gave an understanding of what they actually believed or thought about the church and Christians. And the four most common words that were given in 2007 for what the church was and what Christians represented was anti-homosexual, hypocritical, judgmental, and too involved with politics. Anti-homosexual, hypocritical, judgmental, and too involved in politics. Now, here's the thing. These weren't just the top four things of millennials outside the church. These were common comments of millennials inside the church as well. And I think if I'm honest, as a millennial who's, you know, aging quickly, I feel that. Like, I feel like that's the reputation of the church. Even someone who's grown up in the church, even someone who's led and pastored church, even somebody who's, you know, I've given my entire life to that. I've been in full-time ministry for, you know, 12, 14 years. Like, I've given my life to this, and I resonate with those critiques, those thoughts about what the church is. But the funny part is that asking a very similar group of people what they believe about Jesus didn't necessarily match what they believed about the church. Their overall impressions of who Jesus was were often significantly more positive than their understanding of what the church was. 
See, I had this under uh, conversation. Um, I don't know. And I don't think he would have any problem with me uh, talking about it. Had this conversation with a really good friend of mine several years ago. And it, it's no illusion that the concept of deconstructing faith and walking away from the church and no longer considering yourself a Christian, and being unsure of what you believe about Jesus and God and the nature of religion has been a major part of the narrative of my generation, right? There's tons and tons and tons of people who consider themselves sort of deconstructed Christians. I grew up in the church, but I no longer consider myself a part of it. And so uh, my buddy sort of fits into that camp pretty well. Uh, we went to school together, uh, you know, played Pokemon together. We're really close friends. And uh, sometime after college, uh, sort of like at, during college, maybe uh, my, my buddy went through some of that process, does no longer consider himself a Christian. And, uh, and so I was, I was hanging out with him a couple of weeks ago and we're still very close friends, uh, and hang out very often. And so I was hanging out with him online a couple of weeks ago and we got into this, it was a couple of months ago now, we got into this conversation about religion and, but it wasn't just religion. It was faith. It was spirituality. It was the nature of truth. It was what is true. What isn't true. It was the nature of good and evil and are things good or are things evil. And it, oh my gosh, it was like, it was this really intense, deep conversation. It was like hours like it was, you know, we were getting together to talk about Dungeons and Dragons like three and a half hours later. The two of us are still having this incredibly deep conversation about the nature of the world and the fabric of reality and how it all works and fits together. Right. And so we're amidst the center of this conversation. And on the other side of it, no one's opinion was changed and nobody became, you know, a Christian overnight. Um, but my uh, and, it, you know, my faith was challenged, but it wasn't broken. And um, we had this really good conversation, walked out the other side of it feeling much better better about one another. And we had a deep level of respect for both what he believed and what I believed, which I thought was really good. And throughout that, I sort of asked him what he believed about Christians. And, you know, he really had very few positive thoughts. You know, to him, Christians were kind of like sheep. Um, not that they were all stupid, but for the most part that Christians just sort of, you know, they showed up to church because that's what they had always done. They put the money in the plate because that's what they had always done. They did this because that's what they had always done to him. Christianity wasn't really about what they believed because they didn't know what they believed, or at least they weren't able to defend or argue for what they believed. They sort of had this inherited faith that really didn't have anything to do with their inner convictions or ideologies. It just had to do with convenience. And oftentimes the most convenient thing had very little to do with actually following Jesus and had a lot more to do with a rigid religion that seemed to support their particular political persuasion. As long as their faith seemed to support what they believed and stood for ideologically and politically, then that meant that, you know, hey, like uh, that was okay for them and they could continue to be a Christian, but they hadn't really thought critically about what it meant, what it meant to follow Jesus, to believe in God, to, to read the Bible, to actually follow and do what it says. So to him, most Christians were that. They, they just hadn't thought it through yet. What was even more inner, and and he was, for him, the biggest problem really it, in calling himself a Christian had had to do with associating himself with that. He viewed himself as being smarter than that. And so I asked him then, what do you think about Jesus? And it was really interesting because his opinions about Jesus weren't accurate to what the Bible says, but his opinions about Jesus were largely positive. What he believed about Jesus was usually relatively good things. He didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God. He didn't believe that Jesus died and tried to rise, he rose from the dead to save us from our sins. But his opinion of Jesus was largely like a spiritual guru. He kind of viewed Jesus as this nebulous sort of powerful force that had elevated his consciousness to a level that the people of his time and age simply weren't capable of or had it had access access to. And so Jesus led the people spiritually in that way. And it was this really interesting dynamic because despite the fact that he, uh, Aki and Peach says, are you a fan or are you a follower of Christ? It's a, that's a great question. And there's actually a great Bible study called fan or follower and, uh, or more than a fan, I think. And it's powerful. We did it years and years ago at my church. It's a really great series to take a look at. And I cannot even remember who preached it, but I think it's called more than a fan. It's really, really powerful. And so as I'm, t I'm having this conversation with him, this really deep, really engaging conversation. I'm realizing something. I'm realizing that there is, and I knew this beforehand, but this conversation really emphasized it for me, that there's a problem inside the church where our image that we're putting out, what people are receiving and perceiving of the church and of Christians in general is not accurate of what Jesus is. And people's perception of who Jesus is, who are outside the church, don't have a very good or accurate understanding of who Jesus is either. Their understanding of who Jesus is and their understanding of who the church is are both inaccurate and they're not parallel. They're very, very different. Uh, the script, yeah, it's called not a fan. Thank you, Gina Major. I appreciate it. Take a look. It's, it's really, really good.
And and I I was refer I was thinking back to this passage in the in the book of Second Corinthians, and it's a very brief verse, but it's really powerful. He says this. He says Paul says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are Christ's ambassadors. Ambassadors represent something. I'm going to take a drink of water. Ambassadors represent something that is bigger than themselves. An ambassador of a country is in charge of representing the culture and the language and the people of an entire nation to another nation. They're supposed to be the representatives, the embodiment of, of an entire group of people. And in this case, it's actually flipped where we as the group of people are to be the embodiment and the representation of Jesus Christ. And so if the world looks at Jesus and they have this very strange and skewed view of who Jesus is, and if they look at us and the, the view they have of us is in no way parallel to the understanding that they have of Jesus, which is sort of messed up and a little tweaked in and of itself, then there's this problem with our ambassadorship. We have done a very poor job of being ambassadors of Christ. Now, there's been an overarching narrative inside of our world as there's been cultural shift that has sort of changed the way the church has been viewed. And we have been, there's been sort of an image that's been impressed upon the church. But in another very real sense, we've made a lot of mistakes over the years where we haven't represented Jesus very well. We haven't been truth and love paired together very well. We haven't been compassion that's been displayed to widows and orphans and the imprisoned and the sick very well. And so because of that, we've sort of developed and we've we sort of reaped the fruit that we have sown, right? We've harvested what we have sown. We've been poor ambassadors. And as a result, we have, we sort of put ourselves in the situation that we find ourselves in today. And I think that James has some incredible advice for what we can do. And once again, guys, keep in mind that wisdom literature isn't about rallying people to solve the problem. It's about being part of the solution. And, and that may not sound like there's a difference, but what wisdom literature does not do is it doesn't say this is what you need to do as a whole to solve the problem. It's not about solving the problem. It's about wisdom literature is about bringing the problem home and recognizing your participation in the problem and then learning to become part of the solution instead of creating and making the problem worse. And so we'll resonate with the fact that we, you and I, whoever you are, have also not been a perfect ambassador of Christ. Maybe someone's been a worse one than you, but you, me, I have not been a great ambassador for who Jesus Christ is to the world around me. And thus, my life needs to change. And I think that James has some great advice for that. So let's take a look at James chapter one and a section from James chapter two. I think it's a grand total of about five verses between the two passages. Let's take a look at them. It says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like james chapter 2 starting in verse 14 says this what good is it my brothers and sisters if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds can such faith save them Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Over these years, these two passages have been a bit controversial. In fact, 500 years ago during the Reformation, the great reformer Martin Luther wanted to throw the book of James entirely out of the Bible, specifically because of verses like this. Because there's so much of the gospel that's based around this concept that salvation is a free gift that's given to us. It's, it's salvation through grace by faith. And that's accurate and true. In fact, James even agreed with that. But here James says, when you claim to be a follower of Christ, but you don't do what Christ says, when you go to the word of God and you look into it, it's like a mirror. And if you look into it and it doesn't transform you or change you, it's like someone who walks away from the mirror and has forgot their face. And who would ever do that? Who could look in a mirror and forget what they look like? But in some way, shape or form, we all do it. And, and you might be doing it right now. 
you ever been in a scenario before where maybe you've heard the word preached or you've read your Bible or you've spent time at prayer or for goodness sake, you've even been groggy and looked in the mirror and brushed your teeth and then you, you got out of the shower, you look back again, you're like, well, I don't even like, dang, I have a big pimple on my face. I don't even see that. Because sometimes we perceive things without recognizing them or actually like connecting the pieces of our brain and, and like really grasping them. I don't know if you've ever been there before. If you've, you know, listened to a sermon, if you've read a passage of the scriptures and like you get through it and like you don't even know what you read, you're not even sure what you listened to. So like in one ear and out the other, that we didn't allow the word of God to really impact our lives and transform us. And sometimes it's because we simply don't want to, because we don't want to change the way that we're living. And other times we're just not paying attention. It just sort of like, just sort of hits us and falls away. I've been there. I, I've been physically places, but not actually present there. I'm that way with my kids sometimes. I'm with my daughters, but uh, although I'm in the living room with them, my brain is on a video game or my brain is on my live stream or my brain is on our Discord or my brain is on my sermon or my brain is somewhere else dealing with some other conflict. I've been present, but not present. We've all done that before. And in the same way with the faith, we can do that. We can be absent-minded about it. We can allow it to become routine. We just go there and we do this thing and that's it. But the first church wasn't like that. They didn't have that luxury. To consider yourself a Christian was to sacrifice your life, literally. If you decided to become a follower of Jesus, it was saying, I am willing to die a horrific death. Christians in James' day were being run through the sword. James was killed himself for his belief in Jesus. Christians were being tortured. They were being torn in two. They were being fed to lions. They were being put in cages, lit on fire, and being used as lanterns, human, living, burning lanterns to light the emperor's garden parties. These were the things that were happening to Christians. People didn't just stumble into the faith. They weren't accidentally church goers. When people became followers of Jesus, they were actively followers of Jesus. And then something changed. And about the year 300, Christianity was become legalized. Constantine legalized Christianity. And eventually, in many places in the world, it wasn't just legal to become a Christian. It was mandatory to become a Christian. And then it became impossible to be able to sort the people who were there because they loved Jesus and, and they wanted to serve him and follow him. And then there were those who simply attended church because they were fulfilling their religious duty for the week. And right now in our culture, we're witnessing the death of Christendom. We really are especially where I am in the United States, the death of Christianity as, uh, as this sort of superpower kingdom that begins to control the world, that, that, that oversees empires and countries, and that's done. The culture has shifted. The power that was once in the hands of the church is no longer in the hands of the church in our world. And many people are walking away from the church who were just participants in Christendom and now have to decide whether or not they want to actually make sacrifice to follow Jesus. And James is saying that's what it's about. There was, there was no show up on Sunday morning once a month, put five bucks in the plate and say prayer before dinner in his day. You are either all in or you were not in. That was it. And then James follows up by saying, listen, if you have faith, but you have no works, can that faith possibly save you? Now, this isn't him saying we have to earn our way into heaven. That's not what James is saying here. And I know that because James actually agreed with the apostle Paul. He agreed with the gospel and approved of the gospel of Paul, who said that there is no works that can get us into heaven, but it is the grace of God that we experience through faith. But what James is saying is, can you can you be at all confident that your faith is actually faith in Jesus and not just something that you've claimed for convenience sake? If your life hasn't been transformed, your life must be transformed. Listen, the church doesn't have an image problem. Christians don't have a branding problem. Christians don't even have a culture problem. Christians have an ambassador problem. We've been poor ambassadors. I've been a poor ambassador. We haven't in a healthy and a helpful way often properly represented Jesus well to the world around us. We've been content with comfortable instead of living by faith. We've lived by sight instead of living by faith. We've enabled the criticisms to, to ring true of the church because we have lived those things out. And we can point our finger at Christian celebrities and 
And in a lot of ways, listen, the world doesn't look significantly different than what the, you know, the church doesn't look significantly different than, than maybe what Hollywood does when it comes to mega church pastors and Instagram followers and major, you know, major influencers. Like I get that. And we can point our finger and say, it's because they have failed that the church isn't what it's supposed to be, but it isn't because they failed that the church isn't what it's supposed to be. It's because we have failed and we aren't what we are supposed to be. And please understand, I'm not trying to be critical or hurtful or demeaning or angry. I'm just saying that when we look at the reputation of the church throughout the world, there's a major problem because people view the church as an anti-homosexual, hypocritical, uh, judgmental, and overly political organization instead of seeing it as the truth and life perfectly and in, perfectly lived out in 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 beauty and in everything that it was supposed to be in the person of Jesus. That's the image that the church is supposed to be. That's what we are ambassadors of. Truth and love lived out perfectly, harmoniously, incarnate in our lives, in our gatherings. We are to be the image of Christ. When when we look into the word, there should be an understanding that we actually see our reflection in, and that reflection is the reflection of Jesus Christ. But we actually have to do it. Like We, we can't just say that we are Christians. I'll be honest with you. I would rather have a church of, of struggling, doubting, questioning people who genuinely want to follow Jesus than a group of pew sitters who are just there because that's what they've always done. I would rather a group of people who are fighting for faith, who are working together, who are admitting to their struggles, who are being honest with who they are. Listen, it's not that the church is pro-homosexual. It's not that the church is always not hypocritical. It's not that the church isn't sometimes judgmental. It's not that the church is sometimes not too political. Those things may all be true, but they should not be the things that we're known for. We should be known for the love that we have. What would it look like to have a church that isn't characterized by these four things, but instead is known because they pray for people? What would it be like to be a church that is instead known because of its compassion, because of the way that it reaches out to the poor, because it's the way that it supports the oppressed, because of the way that it fights for justice? What if we were a church that was so on fire for Christ and so committed to following him that these negative things couldn't be said about us, that we would change the impression of what people in the gaming community think Think about the church and think about Christians because we so properly were ambassadors of Jesus Christ that we represented him so well to the gaming community because we paired truth with love and we gave up all of the other stuff, but we have to actually live it out. Like you can not, here, here's, here, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bring up the point because it's going to be on the screen. We don't get to change our reputation if we're unwilling to change our operation. We don't get to change our reputation and I'm not angry. I know I'm getting heated. I'm getting excited, but I'm not angry. I really am not. This is, this is a message from the bottom of my heart, guys. It's a message from the bottom of my heart because since I've been a teenager, I've looked at the church and I think, there's a problem here. What people outside the church are saying about us is actually true. And when I dreamed of leading a church, I dreamed of leading a church that didn't carry those things, that overcame those things, that when people experienced it, would change their view of who Christians are and then would change their understanding of who Jesus Christ is because of the love they would experience through us. But listen to this, you don't get to change your reputation if you're unwilling to change your operation. You don't get to change the reputation of the church if we're unwilling to change the way we do things. We don't get to change the reputation of the church if we're unwilling to change the way we do things. People are anxious to change their circumstances, but I'm willing to change themselves. First off, Jack Lee's LO, welcome into the stream. Glad to have you here with us. My name is Mark. I'm the lead pastor here at Lux. It's such a pleasure and a joy to have us with you. Thank you. You're loved, and we appreciate that you're here with us tonight. One last thing. Information minus application equals stagnation. This is a, a formula that my pastor taught me, and I've sort of tweaked it. Information minus application equals stagnation. You can get all the information about the Bible that you want, but if you don't apply it to your life, you will stagnate and rot. I know lots of Christians, lots of Christians that know a tremendous amount about God, but do not know God. But information plus application equals transformation. 
when we grow in our understanding of God's word, when we read his word, when we hear his word preached and we look in the mirror and we do not forget it and we apply those things to our life, it transforms our lives. But if we will only listen and never apply, we can expect stagnation, not transformation. You have to apply the word of God to your life. You want to change the reputation of the church. We have to change the operation of the church. Which brings us to our next step this week. I will put my faith into action this week. I genuinely do not know what that looked like for you. But I'm guessing you have some sort of an idea about what it looks like for you. And this isn't really like, oh, this week I'm going to put my faith into action. It's a good idea and you probably should do it this week. And I should do it as well. But this should be an inward conviction for us. Church isn't just a thing that we do. It's not a club that we belong to. It's not just going to hang out with people because it's like, well, these people kind of think like me and sort of believe like me and probably vote like me. So I'm going to go and hang out with them. Church should be this alliance of people, this community of people who are so committed to representing Jesus to the world around them because they don't want people to go to hell. Not because they're looking for a place to feel comfortable, but because they don't want, and I hope you feel comfortable here. Keep in mind, I hope you feel comfortable. And at times I hope you feel really uncomfortable here (laughs) at Lux. I hope you're stretched and expanded and I hope you grow because inside of our comfort zone, it's very difficult to apply the truth of God to our lives and actually live it out. But I hope that we're here because we have this commitment to properly represent Jesus to the world. We have this commitment that we don't, we don't want to see hundreds of thousands of people who are on Twitch every day who will never step foot through the doors of the church die and go to hell. I don't want that. I hope you don't want that. One of the first problems that we have to sort out is our reputation. Because I'll be honest with you, our reputation keeps people from the church and ultimately keeps people from the gospel and then keeps people from Jesus Christ. We have to change the way we live. We have to be convinced enough about the gospel that we actually apply it to our lives and live it out. One of the greatest blessings that I have of leading Lux is I get to lead it alongside a group of unbelievable people who actually want to do that, who are actively pursuing, whose faith is reignited, who are actually trying to live out what it means to be a Christian in their context and be an ambassador for Jesus Christ to the best job that they can. And it is so incredibly fun to do that alongside you guys. Almost nobody, no one to my knowledge comes to Lux by accident. We're here because we want to be here. And I can't say that about any church that I've served in the past. And I love those churches. But we had a lot of people who were oftentimes there just because that's what they've always done on Sunday morning. That's not why you're here. You could be doing anything else on Wednesday night. Yet you're calling this your spiritual home. You're here to grow. You're here to be challenged. You're here to hear the word. You're here to worship. You're here to pray for one another. You're here to support one another. Because you believe in something bigger. Let's go into this week and not just say that we believe, but let's show that we believe with the way that we live. Let's pray. Father God, today, tonight, I'm I'm significantly over on time and you just, Sometimes, Lord, (laughs) sometimes, Lord, sometimes knowing your message is good. Sometimes knowing most of it is better. I pray that maybe there were some things that were said tonight that would resonate with some folks. And if there were things tonight, God, that came across angry or dissatisfied, please understand. Please help. Please help those hearts understand that that's not my dissatisfaction with them. That's never my anger with them. If anything, that's my dissatisfaction with me. That's my anger at me. That's my looking at the scope of the church and falling in love with the bride of Jesus Christ and seeing that she has been dirtied and beaten and and has, has just not followed him well. And I'm frustrated with that father because I so desperately want your bride to be a better representation of who you are because I call myself a part of her and I desperately desire to be a part of her. So please, Father, if there's anybody who's in the stream tonight who feels like I've been angry or I've been hateful or I've been condemning, I pray, God, that you would relieve that from them through the power of your Holy Spirit right now. They would be encouraged and they would be challenged simultaneously, knowing that you love them desperately and deeply, that their salvation is securely within your hands, Father, that you will never let them go, that you eternally love them, that you consistently care for them, that you are always in their life, and at the same time, that they would be spurred on by that everlasting and compelling 
fucking love to follow you more deeply and more passionately that they would be a better ambassador and a better representation for that of you to their friends to their family to their workplace to their online communities that their lives would be transformed and through their lives their communities and through our communities the world would be transformed that there would be revival revivals always come on the other side of repentance father so if each of us individually have some ways that we need to repent of not being a great ambassador for you, if we need to repent about being more about our ideologies than we were about your teaching, if we need to be repenting of, of being more about our political party than we are about your kingdom, I pray, God, that we would repent and that we would seek you and that we would live out our faith actively. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. On Demand family, I really hope you guys enjoyed that talk. Thank you so much for joining us here on YouTube. I know sometimes it's difficult for you guys to join us live on Wednesday evenings, and that's why we do the content on demand here on YouTube. That way you guys can watch it whenever it works for you. But if you ever have the opportunity to join us live, we would love for you to do that. We're live every Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. EST at twitch.tv slash Lux Digital Church. One thing that you miss out on by joining us here on demand is the opening time of banter and then the closing segments of Ask Me Anything that we do right here on the couch live where we get to talk to you. We always laugh, we have a ton of fun, we get to chat and just hang out live, which is a very unique experience and we would love for you to join us with that. We would also like for you to join our Discord over at discord.gg slash Lux Digital Church. That's really the home of our church. That's where we do life together day in, day out. We get to play games, we get to hang out, we get to chat. And that's where we grow together as a church family. So join us there. If you enjoy what we're doing here on YouTube and what we're doing with Lux as a whole, you can financially support us over at luxdigitalchurch.com. There's an opportunity to support us there. But nonetheless, we love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will talk to you very, very soon.